Welcome, everyone. My name is Craig O'Neill. I'll be your host today. I have some special guests with me that I'm very excited to introduce. This is Driving Results with Commitment-Based Communication. This is absolutely a topic I know our audience at Auto Text Me is going to enjoy and truly anybody who's engaged in commerce. Our guest today, we have Dan Malloy from Malloy Business Development. And I said it right, Malloy like a hoy, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. And of course, Darren McClay, who has joined Dan Malloy, but is formerly from McClay Tire and Service up in Santa Rosa, California. Yep. Yes. Wonderful. So Dan, I'll, I'll open it up to you. Introduce yourself. Let us know a little bit about your background. Go ahead. Well, no, I, uh, I run Malloy Business Development Group for uh, 21 years. And prior to that, I was an owner, a partner in a company called uh, Procare Automotive. We had uh, uh, over 100 stores. We had 100, 104 stores. We bought the business from British Petroleum in uh, 1998 and closed on it. And uh, all of a sudden, I was in the telecommunications industry. And all of a sudden, overnight, I was in your world. I was in Darren's world, in the world of all the all the folks and dealers that that, that happened to be here with us today, you know, when it was an eye-opening experience, to, to say the least. Uh, a little bit more, so we're gonna, we'll, so my background is I'm familiar with your, I've been in your world for a long time. Uh, the, the, the other piece of it is that I had been started studying language and communication uh, at the age of 30. I'm 71 now. So it's been, I've been involved in the study and the measurement and, and, and of language and communication for over 40 years now. And, uh, and what I realized when I got involved in the pro care operation is I, we were not, I stood up, I remember standing up at a partner meeting one day after being in the business for about four months. And I said, guys, listen, there were 10 owners in the company. It was a, we had a thousand employees. And uh, I said, we're not in the auto repair entire business. And they, that got everybody's attention, you know. And then, they, then I said that we we are in the communication business. Mm, the powerful. problem is we're flying blind. We have no idea. We know everything about our business because we had great point of sale system. We had a P and L every just about every day, and the KPIs <laughs> every week, every day, right. every week. We had all the data, but we didn't know what we didn't know. And absolutely. And, and so I I calculated in a very rudimentary fashion just from sitting in the stores and listening to how we communicated that we were leaving about 40 to 50 million a year on the table. And when I said that, it it started raging debate and even some arguments and <laughs> say, some fights in the room. Yeah. No. I was not. Now I know it's true because I've been, I've, I've, since that point in time, I've analyzed more than a million business conversations word by word. And is that how, Darren, did, that you got connected with Dan as well? Yeah. Um, you know, like you said, we had our company in Santa Rosa, California. My grandpa started it in 1979. You know, your typical family business, you start with one and you continue to grow. Um, you know, a lot of us were, were involved in our family business. And I think we started to see as we went from one to two, you know, you're managing it. You try to split your time between it, but you can't be in the stores with your people as much as you were before. And then when you go to three, it gets to be a little bit more difficult. So, and then as we get to four and five and we have two commercial and it just, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a picture of one of my shops coming up on one of these slides here. Um, As it gets bigger, it's, you got to have processes and things in place so that you can scale up. And, you know, one of the things that my dad was always pushing was our growth can come from capitalizing on our misses. And it's because we're just not making the connections with people, you know, where are we missing and how do we get better and how do we train how to make commitments and relationships with customers? You know, because we had our one store, you know, all those people always came back because they were always dealing with the core people. But then as you expand, you start to dilute that a little bit. So you, you need something in place to train that. And that's Dan came along and started talking to my dad and that was 2011 and for nine or 10 years we were on Dan's plan and uh and, and I just I embraced it like yeah this is what we've been talking about but this is this is a way to teach it so um yeah that's kind of my background and, Beautiful. and we we sold to uh AAA back in 2020 so and now I'm working with Dan I told him five years ago hey someday <laughs> I'm gonna come 
drive commitment-based communication with you. That's what I want to do. So no commitment-based communication. I love it. Chris and I talk a lot about communication. People that have heard us before will have heard us talk about Toastmasters and how important that is for developing communication skills. And that's one thing I love about working for this company is Chris is one of those leaders that does work on developing their people and communication skills are a key variable for that. Toastmasters.org. If any of you haven't heard me talk about Toastmasters before, I'd be surprised. Uh, But I would be happy to talk more about what that group can do as well. Uh, So I do want to go very quickly over some poll results. We talk about communication training and we pulled this with our audience beforehand. And this is the results that we have for the question of how much has your organization invested in communication training? I'm not too surprised to see this all over the place. But if you really look at it, about half of people, it's a very small amount and to a moderate amount, which almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. This is not a scientific study, of course. My wording might confuse some folks. That's all right. Um, But some uh, almost one quarter haven't invested at all in any communication training. Well, you know, let me comment on one thing right here, Craig, just for a minute. But back from reflect on the ProCare days, I realized around that same time that we, we as a company, had a big, thick manual, this thick, on safety. And we hmm. had another manual, this thick, on how to protect the environment. And we had another one about how to how to uh, deal with a lot of the HR issues that we had to deal with, okay? When we came to communication, crickets. No manual nothing. at all? Nothing. Oh. Well, I mean, there were, listen, some managers, yeah. or we had some regional managers, and they would give people like a script. Oh, they had, they had to, hello, <laughs> my name is Dan and I, you know, and it's like, those never work. Yeah. It never works, you know. Maybe so, for a robot, right? Yeah, but it's. Some AI. <laughs> yeah, but we were, right, we were right here. We, we had actually, this is true. I went to one of the other partners that owned a much bigger chunk of the company than I did. And I said, listen, I said, after I realized the, the extent of what we were losing, right, the hole in the bucket was enormous for us. And I realized that. And so I went to somebody else and I said, listen, I said, I will design a training program for the company, teach people how to communicate more effectively. Brilliant. And his response, Dan, they all speak English. (laughs) True. I swear, I quote, they all speak English. They know more about automotive industry than you will ever know. Mm. And well, that was true. And what he said was true. But the, oh, but okay. just because you know how to speak or know how to read and know how to write doesn't mean you know how to do it with passion and with power mm. and, and know how to do it effectively. Right. And so that's knowing how that to do it effectively. And and that was sort of the second area of our poll. Right. It actually was an extreme area of effectiveness. In fact, it's the, the more ineffective end of the scale, I would say. We asked this question. <laughs> Do you have any staff that make you cringe when you hear them on the phone? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. I, hear that, I, I hear that all the time from, from yeah. owner operators. You know, the flip side, the flip side of that is that I just got a I was on a, a coaching call earlier, it might have been last week, and one of the uh, service advisors said, Hey Dan. A woman came in, told me, I came into the store because of the way you communicated with me. I've never had anybody brilliant communicate with me like you did. Never in my whole life. Mm-hmm. Boom. And so it's like interesting. So, so that made your day. <laughs> yeah. No, it does. I, it, it does. <laughs> when the light bulb uh, goes off and people can learn how to how to how to communicate effectively, it's really exciting for me anyway. I I remember the first time when we started recording our phone calls and I heard myself back mm. talking. I would probably say that I cringed when I heard myself on the phone, even though I knew I was good at what I did. I was, I was great at selling service. I picked up little things like, Hey, slow down turbo. You don't need to talk that fast. They cannot hear you when you start getting into the info and data and you go hundred miles an hour. So I thought that about myself. I cringed when I heard myself when I started this. That's a common journey. reaction. When I, people yeah. I got to share calls. with Darren, too. I cringed when I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom. Well, this, again, wasn't a very scientific study in a sense because I have two types of yeses. I think I think I captured the experience for a lot of people with the yes, dot, dot, dot. The aim I was going for is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
But then there's the hey, type listen. that's like, yeah, and I want to fix it. And I love that that, yeah. that came through. I, yeah. I, I just want to comment. I want to comment on what Darren said just for a second, because also I, I happen to be a, a professional singer. OK. And when you're in music, you record yourself all the time. Yeah. And you listen, you listen and you record and you listen. OK. And so if in this in any business really or any type of performance and it's like being on the phone you have to be open to listening and making corrections oh right as absolutely. long as you have some standards you know to work with yeah oh 100% that's brilliant so let's look at this uh one of the things we talked about in the, the webinar today is that there will be a free book author offer from the author <laughs> I knew I would do that, Dan. An author offer. <laughs> so you have written a book. I know we're not going to get to every element of a book. And this is the challenge that we even had in preparing this discussion today is there's a lot of great material for this. So please stick through this. Um, at the end, you're going to get a QR code and we're going to make sure you uh, know how to get that, that book in your hands. Uh, the Language of Commitment, A Simple Guide to Effective Communication in Life. Hmm. And let, me, so let me give you a caveat. Say Please. it's in editing right now. It's going to be ready in the next couple of months. And then if so, if you sign up, you want a copy of the book, I recommend it strongly. Um, it, it, there, there's a lot of really, really, really powerful distinctions inside. And uh, and so I, I'm, I'm thrilled. It's taken me quite a Well, you, you know, what does it take to write a book? Probably five a or lot. six years I've been working no. on it. I applaud you. I'm coming down the home stretch now. Yeah. Brilliant. I can't wait to read it, Dan. I'm looking yeah. forward to this. So what is the language of commitment? I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just wrote the book. <laughs> no, here, here's, I think, a real eye-opening. When I started studying about language and communication when I turned 30 years old, my teacher comes out. I'm not going to get into his whole life story. If you want to learn more about him, you can. His name is Fernando Flores, the philosopher, economist, and everything. But he... Mm. He was from Chile, country of Chile. So he he was the teacher and he comes out to teach. And one of the first things he says to all of us, and I was a businessman and I'm in I'm in sales at the time, right? He says the only time commerce happens is when there's an exchange of commitments that occurs between the buyer and the seller. And I thought that was really fascinating to me, you know. So as I got got further back, you know, further further into the future. And and I wound up with the with the ProCare operation, and I start really started to listen with the, a new level of hearing because now my my economic livelihood depended on what, what all these people how they mm. were communicating, and what I could hear was that there was a total lack of commitment. People were communicating about stuff, about details, about data and information, and tire sizing, prices, and all of that, all this, but never reaching, never reaching. The level of, of, of commitment, you know, like yeah. I promise to have your car ready by five o'clock, Mr. McClay, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. It didn't it didn't occur. We were operating at a different plane. And I know you have some slides up about the, mm -hmm. the, the three layers of communication. But yeah. here's the point. There's an, when you think about and reflect on your own life, you'll see that. Every result in your life is tied to the commitments that you yeah, You asked this question before. I'll phrase it uh, again. Are there any results in your life that are not tied to commitment? Um, there, yeah. there, there may be some. I mean, but not, not really. <laughs> not, not results that you want necessarily. In those I was, I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, stuff happens all the time. Yeah. But any results that you desire, you got to make a commitment. Like the only reason you show up on the job every day. Because you commit to it. <laughs> you wake up and you think, okay, I got to go to work. Okay, the self-commitment. And the next thing you know, you're on the job. Companies, why do companies start? Because somebody wakes up one day and says, I'm starting a business. And I'm going to start it today. That's a commitment. You yeah. Know? And, and so where I can help you with that comes in, into it was 20 some odd years ago, I was operating eight stores in the Toledo market. And I was started the early stages of coming up with a training program. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what's the very first thing that I want my team to declare when, the, when we know it's coming, the customers call up every day and say, hey, how much is this? How much is that? I got a problem with this. How much? I said, well, the only thing that makes sense to me to say it is I can help you with that. 
Yeah. And as I got into it over the last 20 years, it's like it was so powerful. It's a declaration. It is. It is. That declaration is strong. Bob Greenwood, I mentioned he was one of my coaches, passed away last year. I've mentioned Bob quite frequently here. He made a big impact on my life. And one of the things in his his class where I really kind of learned how to work in, especially comprehensive inspections into an actual consulting type of a, a style of managing a vehicle for our clients. And Bob would always have this, this phrase that he would add at the end of, of that pitch. Our, our responsibility is to make sure the vehicle is safe, reliable, and efficient. We won't let you down. And that mm-hmm. that affirming statement, um, I w- once I started talking with you, Dan, it was like I realized like the re- the power behind that is very very much rooted in the fact that uh, a term I I wasn't even aware of it was like the language of commitment that was clear commitment in a piece of communication, and that's why it was effective and it was. Well, think of think about I can help you with that just for a hot minute. Yeah. Right. Uh, when people say you have a soccer mom that's got three kids and now her check engine light is on and her brakes are grinding and the car's hearing strange noises is pulling a little bit to the right. And she calls up and says, how much is a brake job for my Quest minivan? So I always ask, what's her real issue? What's her real concern? Does she need a price? Does she need safety? Yes, she needs a price. She needs safety. But most importantly, she needs somebody that can help her. And it's not just it's not enough to just want to help people. You have to know how to articulate it. You have to be able to say, in my opinion, you have to be able to say, yes, I can help you with that. I am going to take care of you. Your search is ended. Today is your lucky day. I am going to take I'm going to have your car fixed for you today. Whatever. But the point is, start out with, yes, I can help you with that. Mm-hmm. It's it's the first move in making a big, 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 bold commitment to help that customer. Sure. So I invite everybody here, start saying it. Yeah. And Darren, really is that what you applied it in McClay's? Yeah. And I think too often, exactly what Dan said, there's there's a, a several things going on with that vehicle. And she's calling, asking for the price on a brake job. I, and a lot of times, customers or, or potential clients or consumers that's where they start because that's mm-hmm. all they know. They don't yeah. know what else to even do. And it's our job as professionals, you know, with what he described, if I just give her the price for pads and turn the rotors on the front of her car, like I'm not, that's, we haven't even started because that's yeah. probably not what's really going on. So it's about understanding they're starting by asking for price because they, they don't know what else to ask. Yeah, if I, if I go in for an appliance yep. and I say, how much are refrigerators? it's, it's not, that's not even what the issue is. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, there's so much range. We, we got to get to discovering what's going to be best for you. And I know you want to price on a refrigerator. I can help you with that. Absolutely. Yes. Let, let's the, work the, through this together. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the other part of it though, is that her real concern, her real issue is that her life is on hold until she gets that car fixed. She mm-hmm. can't live her life. So a price isn't going to help her. Inventory numbers are not going to help her. Technical talk is not going to help her. The only thing that's going to help that woman with a broken car is somebody like you, Craig, or you, Darren, right? Somebody has knowledge about that says, yes, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to fix it for you. You know, so it's it's the, the commitment to take care of her is number one. Price is never the issue. No. If a car Absolutely is broken, not. let me put it that. If you're going for a lift kit and you want to get new wheels, or it could be. Price could be the issue, of course, but but not if a car is broken. If they got a problem with a car, or the tires are worn out, or whatever, or flat, but it's the commitment is more. It trumps everything. Yeah. Oh, and so part of recognizing this, wouldn't it, would you agree that this when we're getting that call on the phone, like we need to be aware of how this person already is in our network of commitments, or if they're not in our network yet, communicating that this is a thing. Uh, we live and operate networks of commitments. When we talked about this and you showed this picture straight out of your workbook, um, yes. I love how this illustrates that at the the core, supporting all of these things is the language of communication that it drives all of the results that come with this. This is a powerful image, especially coming from a Toastmasters veterancy and how much we talk about communication in our company uh, to see someone else come in with this I love this. Uh, yeah, and you already mentioned this you. showing up every day, capable, skilled, making commitments to take care of each other. And we can communicate that to our clients, even that lady over the phone. 
That's great. Yeah. So where where do we find these people that we can can get to do this? Darren, you talked about uh, where you found some of your best communicators. Yeah, I, I think once once you put more emphasis on how you're communicating with your customers and you're you're really building relationships. You know, so when when several years ago as we we're looking at the struggle, and I think everybody on this call and everybody I talk to, what what's the biggest issue you're facing in your business right now? Finding people, Finding training people, people retaining mm-hmm. people. That's always the first thing. And what I was able to do is I, I instead of looking in the same talent pool, depending on where you are, it's like I feel like certain communities we're all pulling, we're all uh, pulling from the same you know, service background oriented talent pool. But once we started to have this down and I, and I realized the difference in being a good communicator and communicating through commitments and the info and data, I realized I can teach people info and data. They learn that somewhere through schooling or whatever it was. But when I can take people and teach them how to communicate or they already have that, that's where I want to be. So instead of always looking for the next service advisor with 20 years of experience at the dealership or whatever it was, right. I was able to start picking from the cell phone industry, Verizon stores. Three of my best service writers came from Verizon. And slowly as they worked with me, <laughs> as they worked with me, I'm like, man, he really listens to what I say. He's got all this. Hey, you ever think about selling tires and automotive service? Mm-hmm. And slowly I pulled the and once they were there, they could communicate and relate to people really well. And then I would teach them how brakes work, how tires work. And they're still there today. And they're some of the best automotive service advisors you'll ever meet. Really? And they have so quickly created a, a following of clients. You know, as we'd move them from one store to the next to fill a hole, they're like, where's Ryan? Yeah. Oh, he's at Windsor now. Okay, bye. I'm going to see Ryan at, at Windsor. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I trained Ryan. You can deal with me. Like, no, no, Ryan's my guy. See you, Darren. And away they go. That's brilliant. But I'll tell you that that is that is the key to having those long-lasting customers and, and having them trust you. We all want the customer to come and just throw you the keys. How do you do that? By giving them the, the price, by teaching them about alternators? No, that's not it. It's hey, anytime I need anything. Ryan's my guy. I dialed the wrong number one time and said, I need a gallon of milk, but he was still nice to me. He gave me the phone number to Safeway. He took care of me and he said, anything you need, you call me, I'll help you out. And that's, that's what everybody's looking for. They just need help. Yeah. I feel hey, like where we're going is this three layers of communication, Dan. Well, uh, yeah. It, back up for one second. Cause I, yeah. to the previous slide, cause you, you brought up a point. I just want to comment on it real quick. This whole idea of networks of commitments. Yeah. Important. Uh, to see this i think that your family your family is a network of commitments held together by the language more specifically the commitments that you make you know as a parent for instance to take care of your wife to uh, speak from my perspective take care of your wife take care of your children yeah. right it's all linguistic a family is held together by language right a co- your company is a network of commitments the commitments that we exchange say as the owner operator you promise to have the stores stay open, to pay the taxes, to make sure the electric bill is paid, right? To make sure that you have all the equipment, to make sure you have the parts, to make sure you have the point of sale system and you have all this in internet connectivity. And then the employee, somebody you hire, right, comes in and they commit to show up every day, right, and, and bring their very best energy and best mood and best, and they're going to learn the system. And what is their job? Now you have, that's what forms the company is the exchange of commitments between the owner operator and the employees that forms the company. And together now as a team, we make commitments to take care of the customers, all linguistic, all language, right? Your community is a network of commitments held together by language. And here's the interesting part, I think, even your country, United States is a network yeah. of commitments held together by the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all of that's what binds us together. It's yeah. all ling- it's all linguistic. When the language, when the commitments stop in a family, how long does it take for that family to fall apart? In a heartbeat. Not long. Gone. I'm done. All it takes is a declaration. I'm done. Yeah. I've had it with you. <laughs> done. Right. Think about it. It's yeah, the birth of this point. country too. I didn't mean you, Darren. I didn't mean you, Darren. <laughs> no, I, I know. I know. I thought he was taking it personally. <laughs> Whoa! Same, same thing in the business. Look, 
everybody on the call, everybody here in the meeting that has a that has a business, you can end it in one declaration. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm closing the doors tomorrow. Declarations invent the future. That's what's so powerful about these kind of statements and declarations. They invent the future. How often? 100% of the time. So you mm -hmm. be very careful what you declare. Whole countries. Look what happened to the Soviet Union. I think it was 1989. It was over. The, the commitments dried up. The whole country evaporated. Same thing with the British Empire. It disintegrated. But they couldn't keep it together because the commitments didn't work. Not too far apart. Yeah, too. so that's, yeah. that's what understand, understanding how the language of commitment binds things together and how it also can, you know, a declaration of the divorce, <laughs> you know, declaration of bankruptcy, same thing. Hmm. No, that's powerful stuff, Dan. This is uh, this was one of the first things that we started talking about too when we first were introduced by Darren, and and this this has stuck out for me so much. I need you to come to my Toastmasters Club and present on this. I think they'll like sure. that too. <laughs> would love to. I would love to. Be a lot of fun. I can help you with that. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I, I feel like we keep getting pulled into this part of the conversation because this is such an important piece of what we've been talking about here. Uh, you've cited a couple of times that these these three layers of communication and recognizing where we're operating from. And, and I like to ask the question, recognizing these three different layers, we've got, we've got automatic, we've got info and data, and then we have commitment. Where are we focused right now? And Darren, I think you were already hitting on this a little bit yourself. Yeah, well, I, I like that you're showing the picture of the inside of my shops there, because that's... <laughs> that was a photograph of McClay's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And really, if you look at that, I mean, it does sum it up. We're, we're Sometimes that's what it feels like during the day. You know, one guy's shouting yeah. at you, the lady behind with the baby, the other guy's trying to figure it out. They're stumbling parts like that's that's going on all day long, but... Chaos. Chaos. I, yeah, that is our title on there, Chaos of Commerce. Yep. But it's, you know, how do we communicate through these situations? And I think, you know, as I look at this in that picture, and I guess I'm kind of getting off on the picture here, but <laughs> if you have the basis for um, the way we communicate through commitments and being committed, you know, as Dan was saying, the employer committed to the employee, the employee back to the employer. If you are committed through the way you speak and the way you express yourself to your peers, this situation right here, I firmly believe when you are committed to your peers and your coworkers, even though this is going on, this is what gets you that extra 10 to 15% of the effort that gets you through these days right here. Mm -hmm. Because we know if we're not communicating in a positive fashion and we don't do something like, hey, Steve, I know you're backed up. If you need me, I got your back. You let me know. I'll take care of this car for you. If we're exchanging those kind of commitments throughout the day, mm -hmm. What a team atmosphere that we have. And tr and we know when everything's against us and we're feeling negative about each other, how well do we perform and get through those situations? Oh, and not so great, right? Because you default it, to level one communication. Yes. Right? It, it, it just makes us want to, like Dan, I'm done. I just want to go home. And, and then it's just combative where if it's, hey, this was a struggle today. I can remember the cars coming at the end of the day, six o'clock, 6.15, 6.30, wanting a set of tires. And it was, hey, we know the three of us can bang this out in eight minutes. You're at the tire machine. You're at the balancer. I'm over here. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And when you kick them to me, I'll get them on the car. We'll have this done in eight minutes. And we knocked the car out. We're like, yeah, we nailed it. But it's because we're committed to doing our part. And when we say it out loud, I got your back. We just run right through those situations. That's what I love about that picture. Oh, yeah. Because we can let it consume us or we can be committed to each other. And we can work right through that. So I know okay. I went off on a tangent. There. Oh, that's all right. Craig really? is re reading my mind because I wanted him to go back to this. Yes, <laughs> to this. I hear you. <laughs> He's yep. reading my mind. But uh, no, I wanted to comment on, on how I came up with these three layers. I Like I indicated earlier, I've analyzed more than a million business conversations. It's true in a wide variety of industries. The bulk of it is in the, in the auto, automotive industry with car dealerships and mm -hmm. auto repair and tire, but also in, in the glass industry, the propane industry, the water industry, medical, dental, financial services, and others. And I was sitting here one day about 10 years ago, and I had, I had my two monitors here, and I had spreadsheets out because we analyze, we measure the data, and there's ways we do that. 
Yeah. Uh, but I'm, we're not, that's not the focus of this, this call, but of this, uh, this session, but I'm sitting here and I had one of those epiphany. You ever have an aha moment where you see something clearly for the first time? And I could see three layers of communication occurring in, in all, all across all in it. Didn't matter the industry. And the first thing I noticed was that there, there was a lot of automatic stuff going on. Okay, and it made perfect sense to me because, as human beings, we're machines. You're a machine. I'm a machine. Everybody in this meeting is a machine. For what? Survival. It means that our heart rate, blood pressure, temperature control, waste elimination, sight, smell, taste, hearing, everything about us is fully automatic to keep us alive. Well, the aha moment about that for me was that I could hear automatic communication taking place, just like your heart rate is automatic. The language and the communication that most people use on a day-to-day basis is fully automatic. And I'll prove it right now. I'm going to do a little, little experiment we're going to do with the with the whole group here. Okay, get people ready in the chat, folks. This will this should be interesting. So I'm going to ask a question, and I, I want you to respond in your chat window, and just type in what your answer is without thinking about it, just like automatic. Okay, here comes the question: What color is a Ferrari? <laughs> Yep, there it comes. Look at all the reds. Mm-hmm. Now, here's my question. Did you think about it? No. <laughs> Dave I, I like Dave's. I knew someone was going to say yellow or black. <laughs> yeah. to off. I like it, Dave. Any <laughs> color you want. Any color you want. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> but let me ask you, here's another question then. What food do you eat when you go to the movies? Popcorn. It has to be popcorn. No thought involved. Fully automatic. Right. Okay. Here's the third question. How much is an oil change for my Subaru? Same thing. Red Ferrari, popcorn, $39.95, $49.95. How much is a how much is an alignment? Red Ferrari, popcorn, $49.95, $89.95. It's all automatic. No thought required. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so that for me was like, whoa. I could hear that going on. Now, the thing they were on automatic mode about, go back to the previous slide, it was information and data. Mm. Information and data. Everybody was was talking about prices and, and sizes and inventory amounts and technical information. And then, and then, and then. So you have you had literally you know a million conversations. That I, that I analyze, and the bulk of them were automatic mode, people talking about information, information and data all day long. Yeah, the and pop- it's interesting too. A lot of us, the automatic response to the oil change question is, is we started thinking about, okay, what type of car is this? What type of this is that? What type of this is That's that? That's still right? automatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. still automatic. Interesting. Right? Automatic. They might be, well, what's a year making model? Red Ferrari, right. what's the year making model? Yeah, that's blah, exactly blah. where I would have gone in some of those questions. Yeah. Full, full yeah. blown automatic mode, you know. And and here's the, the now why people are involved in information and data and experts at it because everybody you hire and everybody inside your business was born into the information age. And a part of that means that they're all skilled. Everybody has one of these things. Everybody knows how to do spreadsheets and know how to, knows how to look stuff up in a heartbeat. And matter of fact, young people can type with their thumbs faster than I can type with all 10 fingers. I don't know how they, <laughs> I I don't know. Know how they yeah. do it. Not a thumb typer either, but, Dan. But they look up everything. They don't make a move without consulting and looking up the information and data associated with the thing. And so, but that doesn't get you to the commitment layer. And here's the, what, what, I, what I observed and what I've been able to analyze and measure is that there's no commitment present. In information, and in data, and technical information, and in pricing information. That's not where commitment lives. Commitment is a different layer. So the reason we point this out is there's nothing wrong with information and data and pricing. You need it in business, obviously. Of we course. need to talk about that stuff. But there's got to be having the commitment layer present where you stop what you're doing and you say, all right, I'm done talking about pricing and information. I really want to help you fix that car. And I want to see you down here today. I've got an opening at one o'clock or two o'clock, which works best for you. Brilliant. Boom. And we shift into the commitment layer 
And I want to read a section from your workbook, Dan, if that's okay. I want to, uh, this is straight out of your workbook. We're on this commitment level. You say business only happens when there's a shared exchange of commitments. Effective communicators are competent at designing conversations that address a customer's or client's needs or concerns. The level of communication generates and evokes mutual commitments, which result in the exchange of money for products and or services. I emphasize again, Effective communicators are competent at designing yes. conversations that address a customer's or client's needs and concerns. That is absolutely brilliant. The, the, um, well, I appreciate that. Um, and what I observe is that people are great people out there. And we had a thousand employees when I had the ProCure op, wonderful people. Mm. Absolutely fabulous. But like I said, they were, they were taught how to speak and how to write and how to read but not how to communicate by design, not how to design. They didn't have the distinctions you were talking about here. The, how do you, and here's another piece we're, we don't have time to get into today, but I'll just put it out there for people as a, like a kind of little, little hook is that in the whole world of communication, there's only six possible moves anyone can make at any moment in time. And this is what I learned 40 some odd years ago, right? And it, it, it's true today. And so being able to have the distinctions of effective communication, then when you have the distinct, then you can design conversations that are more effective. Without distinctions, how do you design anything? <laughs> you can't. It's just mm-hmm. more of the same automatic red Ferrari popcorn, blah, 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 all day long. Well, the typical interaction that a service advisor seems to have these days, too, it's very, very much a transactional type experience yes. at the counter. And one of the things we've always tried to teach is, is getting to that relational layer of data, uh, that, that yes. relational information, using cues and clues or, or just conversational techniques to get the customer open up and engaging with us. Uh, I use a lot of examples of here in Michigan. I was like, we know that people this in the summertime are going to drive up north. And so we ask that sort of a question is like, have you made it north this year? It's just something in our society that we can work in. Or or one of the examples that we've talked about before is like recognizing when there's a child seat in the car. If you have a service advisor who's not gifted at making these open-ended questions, it comes out really strange sometimes if you aren't trained to do this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it's like, if someone hasn't practiced it or they haven't been provided training on, on what's appropriate or what's not, or, or how to do this, like, you know, Craig, we were talking, like, it, it's a little weird if someone tries to force it with no practice and they see a, a car seat in the back seat and they come in and say to the lady as they walk in, Hey, how old is your baby? Like, just, you know, you, you got to practice these things and you got to have some training. And you know, when it, when it comes to this, I, I don't believe that anybody wants to come to work today and be poor at it. Nobody wants, nobody's getting up and like, I can't wait to fail today. Like people right. want to be successful. So you have to support them. And I know we talk about this a lot, but it's just, I think when you get to the communication and how important that is, and you can help focus on that and train that and help with that, they just become better at everything else because they feel good about what they're doing. And they realize I, I do have people coming back asking for me. And yes, I, he told me I, I'm his tire guy for life. That's awesome. That's, you got to support that. And you have to, you know, you have to cultivate that within your company. That, that's, that's the key to that. But you can't, you can't throw a script in front of them, have them say, how old is your, like, you, you've got to practice these things, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Practice is key. I was looking at the chat window here and somebody said, Andrew said, uh, laying out a story is key. And I agree, 100%. Inventing, this is one of the key skills that people have to learn. How to invent a story about the future. Because when you're talking with a customer right now today, in the moment, in the present, they're going to buy from you. Why? Because they think the future is going to be better. People take action in the moment today because they think it's going to help them down the road. And so in, in our speaking today, we have to teach our employees and we have to you know, teach and train and coach them on how to invent stories hmm. that get people excited yeah. about the future and how I'm going to be your car guy. And you yeah. never have to worry about anything ever again. Yeah. As long as you're working with me and my team here, we've got your back. And if you yep. ever have any trouble, call me. I'm going to help you out. 
you know, and be able to paint a picture that eases their mind, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and I would add too, if there's anything that any of us need in our lives, we, we need, we need help with something. We need some type of service. And we have a friend or family member or loved one or someone that we know closely that's in that industry or does that for a living or understands it. Who do we go to mm. that person? Mm. You yes. know, and, and, and why is that? Because as we talk info and data, I, if I need to run drainage in my backyard, well, we know I can get online and I can get all kinds of different info and data on how I should run this drainage and what I should use and how big a pipe and all that. It gets overwhelming. But if my father-in-law does it, I'm finally just going to go and ask him, hey, how should I do this? And, and why do I take what my father-in-law says versus everything I read online? Because I know that he's committed to me and my family as a family member, and he wants the best for us. Am I ever going to trust the internet over what my father-in-law tells me? Usually not, but, <laughs> you know, but it's, I know he's committed to making this successful and making this happen. And that's, that's what we're talking about. Even on a sales counter, people have to feel that you're committed to making sure their car is fixed. It's done correctly. And you want to see them get back on the road. So they never have to think again. I got my oil change. I got the price. Next time I need anything car related, I want to go back to that guy. That that's that's where this ties in. We want to be your car guy or gal for life, and we want to make you feel it. That's what this mm -hmm. is all about. You know, I I I, I think that's great, Darren. I I looking at another uh, statement here uh, that uh, Michael put into the chat room. He said, "Try this again. We have a bad habit of telling customers no without actually telling them the word no." You know, and I hear that all the time. We because we listen we listen to tens of thousands of phone calls every month in our company. And we hear it all the time. So mm -hmm. how that comes up in an example might be, yeah. well, do you have a, a 205, blah, blah, blah. And they ask for a particular tire size and, and, and manufacturer. And the service advisor, well-meaning service advisor, whose commitment is to help the customer says, I don't have it in stock. He didn't say no, but he could have, been, instead of saying, I don't have it in stock, you say, yes, I can help you with that. I have $5 million worth of tire inventory in my warehouse. And I know I've got that tire and I've got five or six others that would be perfect for you. So it's, just, it's, and I can have it here for you tomorrow. So instead of saying, no, it's not in stock, you say, yes, and I can have it for you tomorrow. The same, same exact conversation, mm -hmm. but the design is different. Sounds simple. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, we, yeah. It's yeah be sometimes, strange. you know, we'll tend to start communicating the roadblocks that are in front of us. Well, I'm backed yes. up. Oh, I got this. I got this. And it's like, Hey, you need a tire. Can I help someone with a tire? The answer is yes. We tend to say that they need it right now in five minutes. That may not be the case. Yes. It's yes. I can help you with this. Yes. Yeah. So we're, we had a great question come in guys from Jessica. She says, uh, have you ever had to work with or support an employee who is over committing? Oh yeah. I, yes. Setting the unrealistic expectations. But if they, and I, Dan, if you wanted to say something, but if they are oh, setting unrealistic expectations and they're throwing that out, if they're actually committed to that customer, they should get, you know, I guess caught setting unrealistic expectations enough. And if they are committed to the customers, that, that behavior mm -hmm. should start to pan out and correct itself. But it does need some form of management to point it out, like, Hey, we are about committing to the fact that yes, I can help you with this. And there's always there's always room for error. Yes, you need a battery. It's ten o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I can have this done for you today. But there's always a room for error. The wrong battery showed up. It was a bad battery. Whatever it is, Th that can happen. But it's just about communicating to your customer that I am committed to take care of this for you. Not I'm going to have it done in fifteen minutes and jump you in front of everybody else. That that does need to be managed. That can be difficult. And that. I'll tell you, Jessica, that does drive me crazy when we <laughs> set ourselves up for failure because that's not a commitment to the customer. I feel that is trying to lock in a sale and get someone to commit just to say, yes. know, yeah. just yeah. to say yes, when you know you can't follow through. And I, I don't think that doesn't create long-term relationships. There, there, there's another clients. piece to this, Darren, that, that is, I think, really important to bring up that the commitment that we make up front at the counter is only as good as the commitments that the techs make in the back. Mm -hmm. One rides on the other. So you could make a commitment to a customer up front 
Well, depending on what it is, I would want to check with the tech who's going to be working on it. Yeah. And say, can we have this by three o'clock? Is that possible? Because it is the network. It's the exchange of commitments that forms the company. If you want to maintain good relationships with your tech team, you should only make commitments that, that they're going to help you with. Right. Yeah. They're going to make happen. This is why our to. developers let us know when a feature is coming out and they just tell us soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but that's why we we, we invite and we, we, you know, as clients work with us, we start out typically with the sales staff and the, and the manager team and, and we work with them. But I really want to include the techs and everybody else in the conversation, too, because it is a network. The company is tied together by language. And if somebody makes a, a, a bogus commitment up front, it impacts, impacts everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we talked about uh, uh, th- this being a communication-based business, right? And this is one of those things. I'll even pull in the chart again for the, the investment level that we're putting into communication. How do we begin investing this? What's that look like when we start training our people? You want to take that, Darren? Uh, say it again. I was reading. How, how does this look when we start actually training our people? Like, what do we focus on? Like, for example, in Toastmasters, one of the things that we actually emphasize when we first start dealing with uh, a new new attendee to our club, we everyone comes because they want to become a better communicator. But we often find out very first thing, first thing and foremost is that the first thing you have to do is become a better listener, right? And there's like this whole strategy, and, and they have to figure out how to listen to what somebody else is saying in order to be able to make any kind of, I'll I'll use the language of commitment here, make any other kind of commitment in that conversation. It's very difficult to be able to engage another individual unless you have listened to them good enough to be able to understand, as we talked a moment ago, the client or customer's needs or concerns, right? Mm -hmm. So we emphasize listening and we take on certain roles to do that. But you guys are listening as the first thing that you do when you're working with a shop. And then what's the how do we give the feedback then to the individuals? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the experience that we had, and I do this now with Dan and our clients now is um, at, at first it is listening, I think, to yourself, hearing yourself back and how you are communicating with people. Just that right there when you can have mm-hmm. that self-reflection, because sometimes people are hearing themselves for the first time, you know, Um and then from there, once you hear yourself and you see how you're performing, it, it's a matter of, you know, there's there's scripts that you can do, but it's just a foundation for learning. You just need to hear how you're doing it now, you know, get, get a scope of what your performance is now, and then get an idea of what are the steps as a foundation to go through to make these connections with customers. And you just have to learn that and you have to practice it. Mm-hmm. This is learning to communicate. I don't think is any different than learning to shoot a basketball or hit a baseball or be on a football team, but you have to have a playbook in front of you and you all have to be on the same playbook. I love Dan's analogy when he says if a football team, if they all had a different playbook and then they went out there and they they're running a play and they all run it differently, how well does that team perform? They all know the idea is to score a touchdown, but if they don't have the same process and practice in place that no, you're going to run this way, you're going to run this way. And I'm not good at football. I'm, 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 you're going to run here. And I'm going to throw you the ball. That, that's how we have to, and it comes from practice. Professional athletes practice all day long, but I think what happens is because we can, we can speak, we can talk. We've been doing this for a while. We don't think we have to practice it, but we do. And, and that's, that's what we work on. It's practicing. It is role-playing. It's a little bit awkward mm-hmm. when we sit there and I'm going to say ring, sure. ring, and you're going to do this. Guess what? It's that you're, we're just running a scrimmage. We're, we're practicing the moves. We're, yeah, we're, we're just doing it verbally. Yeah, and, and that's that's where it has to start. In front of your peers, right? As exactly. Well. Yeah, 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 it's tough for a lot of people. Toastmasters will do this to you too. It's one of the reasons I enjoy doing it is the feedback that you get whenever you're doing a presentation. Like I'll even ask my club members to review these webinar videos from time to time, get the feedback yeah. on that. I had, I had a good friend uh, giving feedback from another webinar the other day. I love getting it. Uh, because when you orient yourselves towards constant improvement, and like if you are truly, and, and we talked about this in the level three communication, uh, you, when you develop a passion for communication, it's self-motivating to keep that improvement. You're going to see the results of that improvement. I, I, it sounds like, Dan, you gave that that story from the guy who reached out to you, told you the story about that customer who's coming to them because of the way they're communicated. Yes. That guy must be on fire for this right now. Yeah, oh, he is. So he actually... <laughs> He's in, he's in training to be a coach with us, right? Wonderful. He loves it so yeah. much, yeah. 
That's yeah, brilliant. It's, uh, it's great. I was going to I was going to share something. The other slide. Or do you want to see another slide? Because I wanted to share this one because we made this special for Darren. I look good that day. My hair was on point. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. I believe that. Yeah. So the only time commerce happens, you have an exchange of commitments. Yes. That's a bold statement. Yeah, it's true, though. Think about it. People don't walk in and just hand you $100 and say, have a good day. <laughs> no. They want not, something in exchange for it. Yeah, not initially. But if you've built that relationship and that foundation over time, you know, that, that was the best. Hey, Darren, yeah, it needs the oil change. If it needs anything else, you just do it. Can I have it back by five? Yes, you can. Thank you very much, Woody. I'll oh, but that was, the, that was the exchange of commitments. Yes, we, can you do it? Yes, I have it done by five. I, yeah, you see, I don't even realize I'm doing it. Right now, now, yeah. now the, money, yeah. the, money, yeah. the money always shows up after the fact. After the commitments have been exchanged, then then mm -hmm. the work then the money shows up. It's the same in just about every business, you know, mm -hmm. that the money shows up after the fact. Yeah. But um, what business are, are are we in? What was that slide you had up? There was a previous slide, two back, I think. Uh, sure, Greg. Um, we were talking on this one here. You asked, "What business are we really in?" You know, the mm -hmm. the, the communication business. And uh, um, uh, what was I? What was I going to say? Now I forgot what I was going to say about that. It'll come back. I so messed it'll come back. Yeah. We're not going to get That's the whole right. book in the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. That's all right. Go ahead. No. So, so one of the things that we started talking about as well, and and of course, being in, in auto text, we we have written communication as a, as a cornerstone of of what we engage in. And this we've realized, and I, this quote actually came from you in one of our first conversations. Where reading commitments feels affirming. I loved. That. I like that. I like that mm -hmm. too. Now yeah. this made immediate sense to me, and and I think this goes back into some historical context for how people communicate as well, because the newspapers and anything else, and the written word, books as well, something that got printed out and published. Uh, the early days of of newspapers going out at, when the the printing press first became thing, printed news. How how immediately uh, valuable that was how trusting people were with that. It reinforces trust in a whole different way that it seems something related to the effort, I think, that goes into getting those words to someone because this doesn't take that much effort, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the language of commitment, um, the model, and, and this is what I wanted to talk about before. It's like, there's a couple of things. One, having a model. You, you had asked, how do you implement? How do you implement yeah. Back a few slides. How do you implement? Yeah. Well, it may seem like an overwhelming task. Like, like think back to when I had a thousand employees and a hundred plus stores, and we that business really, and we had the KPI reports a lot. But the business of the business was millions of conversations that were taking place in the company on an annual basis. How do you keep track of millions of conversations? How do you make sense out of it all? Well, we built a system to do that. To because we know it's an overwhelming daunting task to even think about when you say you've got 20 stores right and you got hundreds of employees how do you well okay well here's the thing if we analyze every phone call that comes into one of your stores on a monthly basis and we do this all the time <laughs> you realize there's only about five or six what i call mission critical business conversations Mission critical recurrent conversations, the same conversations happening over and over and over every day, all year long. And there's only about five or six of them that drive the entire business. There's lots of one off conversations, but they're not going to impact that much. So when you have when you know what your five or six conversations are that drive the whole company, then having a model that we can apply to those conversations makes the training and teaching e very easy. Yep. And something that that it's not like climbing Mount Everest. We then you we feel take it five to six is typically even in a general repair typical auto repair shop, pretty much the norm. Yeah, well, I'm saying there's a service call, there's a tire call, mm -hmm. there's a brake call, an alignment call, there's mm -hmm. a flat call, there's uh customer service, and what I got there's you. about five or six. And we measure, we know, we know the quantities, you know, like yeah, you can actually classify them once you start measuring yes. this sort of yep. thing, right? Yeah. The quantities of these types of calls. And then, then we have a model with a language of commitment model that we then, so we, we design an approach for an inbound call. We design an approach for an outbound call. When you have to call back the customer and tell them, 
you know, that they, they that their car is ready and that they have to spend an extra twenty eight hundred dollars with you. How do you do that effectively? We have an approach all based on a model. Oh, that's know, brilliant. So that, and we teach the model, not unlike not unlike if you're playing golf or or football or whatever, you you keep doing like Darren says, you role play, you, you keep hitting the same shots all the time until you get really good at making a commitment as it relates to tire calls or making commitments as it relates to break calls or complaint calls. It all involves listening and everything else. But but the point is we've designed a system that is very, very manageable, and easy to accomplish. It just takes a little time. Many of you know Mountain View Tire. You've heard Mountain View. I'll just throw out a few sure. things. We're running low on time. Yeah. I worked with Mountain View Tire for 18 years and they sold their business a year and a half ago to Monroe. Boom. We worked with with uh, uh, McClay's Tire and Automotive, and I remember cold calling your dad one day, and he picked up the phone by accident. <laughs> he, got me. he got me. We tried and to kick him all the voicemail. And here we are. Here we are now. Right, right. No, I remember he, he told me. He went back, and I was talking to him about language and communication, the six moves. I, and he went back to and spoke with you and your your uncle and, and said, I'm not sure exactly what Malloy was talking about, but – but there's something here. We got to we got to understand what this is, you know, and mm-hmm. he did. And to your credit, and you became experts yeah. and you embraced you embraced the model. That's the point. It's a, it's a model for effective communication, I call it. And it's not difficult. The, the big challenge, the big challenge is implementation. Yep. Yeah. Be- because you have say you have 100 employees who all show up with different ideas. If we ask, if we were to ask all hundred employees, what does it mean to communicate effectively? If communication is the foundation for everything we do in life, then what is effective communication? What does that mean? Well, I don't think we're going to get everything you have to offer in this one webinar, Dan. I know. I think I know. we are definitely going to have to do this <laughs> again. Go on. And we I do have on the, go on for two days. the contact information. So, folks, uh, I think you see very quickly why I was so excited to have these guests with us today. Uh, the topic is is deep, and it gets us thinking about how we're running our shops in, in whole different ways. Uh, so I do encourage you, please uh, feel free to reach out to these folks. Their emails are on the screen uh, if you have any questions. Uh, let us know. We're going to put this recording up and uh, that'll be available hopefully in a few days here. We'll have that all set for you guys. But Dan, Darren, I'd like you guys to go ahead and uh, give any closing remarks you have for our audience. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, I, I just, um, you know, I, I think you guys can see as Dan and I, you know, sometimes we get off on tangents and my favorite word is the passion that we have for what we do. Because I just, I believe in helping people get better and succeed. I mean, when I was a little kid, I want to be a teacher. So I feel like I get to do that mm-hmm. now. And I just, I feel like there's so much growth potential in so many businesses and it doesn't, it, it's there. It's just the growth is capitalizing on the misses and it's just being ready to recognize what type of conversation am I having? Okay. This is what I need to do in this one. The details might be different, but it's recognizing how to communicate better with people. And that is where the growth in individuals comes and in companies themselves. And I just, I love what we do. And I, I big thank you for having us be a part of this. So yeah. um, I look forward to doing some more or anything absolutely. you need, Greg, you can call on me. Uh, I absolutely will. No, thank you so much, Darren. Dan. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Darren, that was great. Uh, I just feel at this point in my life, you know, uh, I feel really blessed that I have a, 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 a mission in life hmm. and passion for what I do. And, you know, to, to that w- people say, Dan, when are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? I said, from what? I love what I do. I love, I'm writing, I make videos. I talk to people. I just got invited to speak at the, uh, the Virginia um, Automotive Association show next year. And uh, I want to do more of that because I, I know that I just want to help people succeed. And I, and, I, and I want to teach them about how to communicate more effectively. That's what I'm on the planet to do. <laughs> and that's what my business is all about. I'm right. thrilled to have Darren here with me now. And you see his, is he a passionate guy? I think so. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah from time no, to time. No, yeah. I've had so much fun preparing this with you guys and Dan, Darren, and someday we're going to figure out how to get you as a guest in our Toastmasters club, even if it's virtual. I, I think love, that'll I be love a that. blast. Yeah, that'd be fabulous. That'd awesome be cool. guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much, everyone. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thanks now. everyone. Bye. Thank you.